back to the system instead of chasing it and trying to kill it off. So here's just some examples of fungi that exist and live out there that are actually feeding off of insect pressure and keeping them under control. Now I thought it was real interesting, I had a call from a lady up in Idaho a while back and she heard my presentation. She goes, oh I, I believe that what you're doing works on aphid, but she said the trouble up here in Idaho is we have a lot of trouble with the Colorado potato beetle. And ironically, we down in the valley, we've never seen a Colorado potato beetle, but they're struggling with an Idaho. But she said, she goes, I don't think that your system will work on Colorado potato beetle. And I said, well why not? She goes, well I don't think Colorado potato beetle has any predators. I said, well, I don't, I've never dealt with it. I don't know. Let me do some research. I spent about 10 minutes on Google and found that list there. Ladybugs will actually feed off of the eggs of Colorado potato beetle. There's a lot of other beetles that actually feed off the Colorado beetle itself. And the last two on the list there are actually beneficial fungi that will help control Colorado potato beetle. So here we have a, a university lady from Idaho and doesn't even think a predator exists, but there's a predator for everything out there. And she said, well, we've tried biological control on Colorado potato beetle, but it didn't work. But here's the problem. I guarantee they were trying that, that biological control in a conventional system. They didn't have all the other components in place. Biological control will not work if that's the only one component you're using. You need all the other supporting factors there. You have to look at the big picture. Once you get everything functioning together, biological control will work. Uh, we have a lot less weed pressure now. And also in the weeds we do have showing up now have changed. Um, we, you know, we used to have some thistle out there, we used to have some fillery, we never knew how we were going to get these problems controlled. We did it by feeding the life in the soil. We've changed our soil structure, we've changed the carbon. Weeds are a great indicator of what's going on out in your soil. There's some great charts out there and when you look up a specific weed it'll tell you what's going on out there. And when you go through this chart and look at the weeds we used to have trouble with, they're weeds, they're indicators of usually a fertility imbalance in your soil, soils that are tight, waterlogged, and, and lacking um, organic matter. So now that we've brought those components back, we've now got an environment where these weeds don't thrive anymore. So now we don't have to go with the herbicide trying to kill the problem. We've solved this problem by adding life to the system. So there, there's a good idea of where we were and where we are now. You'll notice all the components are still the same, but the relationships have completely changed. And here, here's how I see the biggest difference between what's on the left and what's on the right there. Conventional agriculture is always about removing from the system. You've got a problem, you must remove it. The way I look at it is all those things are important. You need them in a certain amount because they help the system function as a whole. Like I said, I'm the only guy that actually likes having a few aphid in my field. Because you need some aphid in your field to feed the predators to keep that population alive. <clears throat> so now here's kind of the, the next step we took. Now that we learned about bringing life into the soil, when we first started off we were doing a monoculture with our green manure crop. We saw huge benefits when we first started off with the green manure crop we were doing just Sudan grass. We were still returning that carbon to the soil, it was breaking up the cycle, it was huge for us. But we were still missing one component and I, gave, I give Jay a lot of credit for helping us out here because was that probably three years ago you are out at our place? And that's when we were doing just a Sudan grass and Jay had a good talk with me about bringing diversity into the system. He said that's great what you're doing with the Sudan but you can do so much more with diversity. So that's when we started going down this path of bringing diversity onto the farm. Last year we did a, a 10 species, multi, uh, a multi-species green manure crop that included 10 different species. Now when we were putting this mixture together, and I don't know, our, Jay may talk about some of this stuff too, this might get a little redundant, but there's four main categories that you want to kind of have all these categories covered. You've got your cool season broadleafs, cool season grasses, warm season broadleafs, and warm season grasses. So out of our, our mixture, here's how all of ours fit into those categories. So if you notice, we've got at least one in each of those categories. And, any, and it's okay to double up in certain categories because the more diversity you get out there, the better off you're going to be. Now the other thing that you want to keep in mind with these four categories is you always want at least a couple of legumes. So that's where our, our peas and lentils came in. The legumes are just so important by adding nitrogen to the system. I don't know if there's anybody in this room that would turn down free nitrogen. That's what we're getting from it. The plant's doing us a huge favor. So let's use it to our advantage. 
Now what's really nice about the multi-species, you see, you'll notice I have Sudan grass there, and Sudan grass is a, is a wonderful green manure crop. It did a lot of good things for us. It's known for its nematode suppression and for its subsoil conditioning. But what you'll notice with these other components is they all serve a very specific role as well. The buckwheat I really like having out in, in our soil. We've got a high calcium, so our, our phosphorus tends to get tied up. But buckwheat has a, a very acidic root that allows that phosphorus to immobilize and makes it available to the plant. The radishes and turnips are great. They've got a great big taproot that go down and break up some hard compaction for us. Um, we've actually greatly changed our tillage practices by incorporating these radishes and turnips. Most guys right after potato harvest will go out with a, a deep chisel and rip the ground because there's a lot of compaction that happens at potato harvest time. We've actually eliminated that process completely. We leave that ground alone. We'll go out with a light disking early in the spring just to control weeds, but then we're planting our green manure right into that. And originally we thought, man, there's no way that crop's going to thrive. There's a lot of compaction out there. But with those deep tap roots, the living root in the soil is actually doing the tillage for us. It's really conditioned that soil even further. Now we've got the peas and lentils out there. So now we've got nitrogen, uh, nitrogen fixer out there in our green manure crop, which is reducing our inputs further the next year when we're growing our potato crop. So now each of these have their specific roles, but here's what happened when we start combining these components together. Instead of planting just one of these and just getting that one benefit from it, by putting them all out there at the exact same time, now we're getting all of these benefits every single year that we do it. And it, it's a really neat thing to be a part of. And I'll tell you, there's another huge advantage to doing multi-species green manure crops. Originally, we were doing potatoes and barley. Those are the only two plants we had on our farm. I tell you what, it was boring. I think you guys know, we're farmers. We like growing stuff. There's something in our blood. It was so nice for me to go out there and grow something I never grew before. There were so many different things in this, this mixture here that I didn't know what most of those things were. So it was fun when it first started popping up. We, you know, I was able to identify some things and figure it out. I process elimination. I got down to this one last plant. Never seen it before. I had no clue what it was. So I actually gave Ray Archuleta a call and said, hey, what does buckwheat look like? And he was kind of explaining it to me and he wasn't doing a very good job. He goes, you know what? He said, hop on Google and type in buckwheat. It'll show you a picture. That's what I came up with. <laughs> so there's a little lesson to be learned here. Be specific when you're going on to Google. But if you scroll down far enough, I did find the picture. And yeah, sure enough, it was buckwheat. So now it's exciting because we're going out there and it's like, when I talked to Keith, it's like, man, what can we grow this year? What can we throw out there? I want to throw out something different, something we haven't grown before. Let's see what, we'll see what we can do out there. It's, it's, it's an exciting time. It's great when we have our soil health tours and going out and looking at these. Uh, Billy Burns was giving me a bad time because the first year we did a, a mixture, it was a seven species mix, and this last year we did 10. And he said, oh, shoot, I only did nine this year. I wanted to beat you. <laughs> you know, we're all on the same team here. So here's one thing that's going to be a little different than what Jay's going to talk about, is the incorporation of the green manure. And we've, I've had plenty of conversations with him and Ray about that. We do incorporate our green manure because we're growing a potato crop the next year. And I've really got to get this residue broken down before we ever plant the potato crop. Because if I've got too much residue out there, it causes major issues for us at planting time. But keeping in mind, I, I, I agree with what's going on with the no-till. I think it's appropriate for where they are. But I've, done, I've taken great strides in reducing our tillage in our soil. This right here is the only tillage we do on our soil. So I'm doing one deep disturbance of our soil every other year. And, and we've seen huge benefits from that too. Whereas most guys in the valley, I mean, they're out there. I, we call it recreational tractor driving. I mean, I, I don't know what they're doing out there sometimes. It, didn't you just do that? It looks great. And they're out there just back and forth. It, it's costing them in labor. It's costing them in fuel. And it's destroying the soil. So now let's get back on the subject of diversity. Like I said, 20 years ago, this is what we were doing. We were doing potatoes and barley. Not much diversity out there. We only had two different plants growing out there total. So we went to potatoes in Sudan. And the reason we went to the sand to Sudan originally, well, it, was, it was mostly a water savings issue. But once again, so we broke up the cycle a little bit, added a little bit of diversity that first year, but it was still Sudan. And that's one thing that really stood out to me when we were talking to Jay. I told him, well, we brought in Sudan. We've seen such great things from this. He said, but by having that monoculture out there, you're limiting yourself of what you're going to see there. So that's when we, that was our first mixture we did on the multi-species. It was a seven-way mix. Saw huge, great things from it. 
This year we went to a 10-way mix and increased the diversity even further. But the trouble is, we've, in our rotation crop, we've got 10 species out there. But during our cash crop, we've still got the sad, lonely potato all by itself. So I worked on, two years ago, I was, had a thought. Once again, Tonda Ray and all these guys, and they were talking about companion crop in their corn and all these different things. I thought, man, there's got to be some way to increase in diversity out there in potatoes. And I got to think about it. We, we do a lot of roguing with our potatoes, and I was walking through the field, and I was used to just, when I was roguing, I would pull a weed whenever I saw it, and we came to a pea, because we used to grow field peas. And there was a pea growing right there in the potato, and I thought, eh, it's not doing any harm, and I walked by. Well, shoot, if it's not doing any harm, maybe we need to take it the other way and actually start adding them back to the potatoes. So two years ago, we were planting potatoes, and me and my brother just hopped up on the planter, and I handed him a bucket of peas, and I said, just plant some of these as we go along. And he said, how many? I don't know. Just get them out there. So we just did two rounds with the potato planter just to see what it did. I tell you what, peas and potatoes belong together. It looked fabulous. And this year, we added chickling vetch another legume and they're really looking really nice together so now look you know we've got the potatoes there that's our cash crop I'm growing 12 other species of plants all to grow just that potato crop most potato guys look at that and think you're crazy that's it's, it's way too much to be honest with you I think we're just scratching the surface would you say Gabe Brown plants 50 different species on his farm you know there's guys up in North Dakota setting the bar really high for us we've got a long ways to go this is a huge stride though, I think we've done a lot. So here's what I like about having that pea and chickling vetch out there as a companion crop. First of all, it's a diverse root system. The root system in the soil determines what biology is going to thrive in the soil. They release these exudates, they feed the different components of the biology. When you only have one plant out there, you're only going to feed so much biology out there. Let's get some different roots out there at the same time. It's a nitrogen fixer. It's taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and adding it to the soil. So now I've got legumes in my green manure crop, now I've got them in my potato crop. I've got legumes every single year giving me free nitrogen. As I move forward, I can pretty much guarantee you our inputs are going to go down even further. Um, one thing I really wondered about as far as the nitrogen fixation goes, we know those peas are fixing nitrogen, but at what point is that nitrogen going to become available to my, my potato? I didn't know if I'd get a benefit right then, or I didn't know if I'd be benefiting my soil further down the road. Either way, I didn't really care as I knew I was adding nitrogen to the soil. Had a great conversation with Chris Nichols last year. She's up in North Dakota in Jay's area, and we got to talking about that. She's pretty sure that we're getting benefit right then and there, and what she thinks is going on is there's mycorrhizal fungi that live in the soil. She's pretty sure that the mycorrhizal fungi is attaching the potato root to the pea root and actually transporting the nutrient through that mycorrhizal fungi. Now, if we're out there spraying fungi and killing off the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, do you think that's going to happen? You need all of these other living components out there to work together. Another thing I really like about having the peas and the chickling vetch out there is they bloom a lot quicker than the potatoes do. You have more flowers out there. What do flowers do? They attract insects. They're going to bring in predatory insects and create that environment where the predators can thrive in between aphid populations. And the other thing, the reason I've, I picked the pea and the chickling vetch is I think there are certain companion crops you could plant out there that would actually compete with the potato crop. It would overwhelm it. It might cause problems at harvest time. There might be all these other factors. What's really nice about the pea is it came up at the same time as the potato, and it's, it's a vine, so it climbed the potato plant. And no point did it ever compete. They were very complementary. They actually looked very pretty together. So after we tried our little trial out there and figured out that it was going to work doing the companion crop, we had to go design a potato planter that would be able to do this for us large scale. Um, went up to Blackfoot, Idaho and talked to the guys there at Sputnik and they thought I was crazy at first, but they didn't care. They were a bunch of engineers. They thought it was cool to build something different. They didn't really care why I wanted to do it, but they did it for me. So I put some gandy boxes on the front of our potato planter there. It's driven right along with the drives for the cups that plant the potatoes, and I, I can change out sprockets on there. So I did, I don't know, probably 10 different trials as far as seeding rates and different mixtures between peas and chickling veg and trying to figure it out. And I think I've got a pretty good idea of what I want to do next year. So next year it's going to be full scale. We're going to have companion crop across our entire farm. So there's an idea of the, the pea seed and the chickling veg. And I think I might play around with some buckwheat seed as a companion this year too. 
We had a little bit of buckwheat seed that volunteered from the green manure crop the year before. So we had some buckwheat coming up out in the potatoes and not a whole lot. But what was nice is every time you saw these buckwheat, they bloom really early. They put out a huge cluster of flowers. Every time you saw one, man, that thing was just buzzing with insects. So I think I want to get some uh, the buckwheat out there as a companion just to attract predators. Once again, bringing more life back into the system. Um, one of the questions I had when we were doing the companion cropping, you know, when we plant a potato seed piece, we're, we're down there about six inches. I didn't know if that little pea seed was going to be able to make it through six inches of soil and emerge. But as you see there on the left, that's the potato seed piece that's sprouting, and there's the peas. The peas were actually beating the potatoes out of the ground. And I think one of the reasons why it worked for us is because we have that nice, mellow soil. It was easy for that pea seed to, to push through. So I don't know if this would work in, in some poor soils, but I, I'm hoping we find out. I'm trying to encourage some guys to get out there and try it. So here's a couple of pictures of the peas and the potatoes emerging at the same time. So can you see the two different plants there coming up? Looks pretty nice to me. And then here's one of the, my favorite pictures that I took all summer long. You can't tell me those plants don't belong together. Look how complementary they are to each other. I've got such a different perspective now when I go out to fields. I think in conventional agriculture we've been trained that here's the crop I want to grow, that's all I want to see out there. We want this sterile environment with nothing else out there. Now I go out there, out there and I'm disappointed. It's like, man, I need something else out here. I'm trying to bring more into it. And here's a good picture of the potatoes with the peas growing in them. Can you see the peas? It's pretty tough, which actually emphasizes my point. They complement each other. At no point did that pea ever cause a problem. But whenever you went out and dug a pea, those were the nodules I was pulling off the peas. I guarantee that pea was bringing nitrogen into that soil. If you have nodules like that, absolutely. So now here's another benefit I'm getting from the peas. The peas grow, produce seed, viable seed at harvest time. The pods get crushed and shattered and dispersed throughout the field. And after we're done with potato harvest, we get a little bit of moisture. This year I had streaks of peas coming up in my potato field. That's always been one of our issues in the valley is trying to figure out how to get more living plants out there after potato harvest time. By the time you're done with potato harvest, it's hard having time to get out there planting the crop, watering it, getting it going. Now I've got another a short green manure crop that's already planted for me. The seed didn't cost me a thing and I'm adding more nitrogen once again. So now when you go back to this table here and you, you look at how we had it built together before, that was more focused on a more monoculture type system. But what's really nice is when you start bringing diversity into the picture, what it does is it strengthens this picture even more. You got so many things going on out there. What's really nice is as we've been improving our soil health, we had a focus as far as certain things we wanted to go after, but we've actually solved other problems that we didn't even know existed at, at first. Once you start building this system, you get this synergistic thing going together, and it, it all works together and builds itself, and it's a really neat thing to be in, you know, a part of. <clears throat> so now I wanted to talk a little bit more specific for you guys. I bet you're getting tired of hearing about potatoes. So I, I challenge you guys, go home and do some homework. Build your own chart. Here's your corn crop you're growing. What are the issues you have surrounding you? What do you currently do to control those problems? What other problems are you creating by trying to control those problems? I'll tell you one thing right now, the first thing that stands out to me is a monoculture. I think that's one of the easiest things we can fix. Because that's what you see right there. It's the corn and that's the only guy out there. There's a really neat book, if you guys are looking for a good picture book. This guy, uh, David, I ain't going to try the last name. He, he went out into natural settings and he had a, a, a cube. And he put that cube out there. And what he did is he wanted to take a picture of every living component of what was happening in that one square cube. So here's an example of what he discovered out in nature. Now look at all the diversity that we have there at the bottom of that picture. Look at all the different plants we have living together. Now you need those, that diversity in plant life in order to have all that other diversity out there. Without the diversity down there, you wouldn't have all the other bugs and insects out there working together. And which, what I see there is I see a very complete system. There's very few holes there. There's nowhere for anything to come in and create an epidemic because 
you, you can't tell me that any one insect is going to come into that system and overwhelm the system. For every insect that might come in, there, there's no telling how many predators are there to keep that insect in check. Here's another one. Once again, great diversity at the bottom of it. Look at all the other life that is out there. Well, he also went out to a monoculture corn crop. That the, the corn was the only plant living out there. Do you guys want to guess how much other life was out in this system? It's kind of embarrassing. That's it. You see all the holes that are there? Those are all opportunities for other problems to come in and establish and overwhelm that crop. So I think it's funny, so you start talking about to guys, and well, you ask them, well, why do you grow a corn monoculture? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, I don't know if I agree with that. The Anasazi Indians, have you ever heard of the Three Sisters? They used to do companion cropping all the time. And they were doing an environment with a lot less water than you guys have here. It was a really neat system that worked and functioned well together. So they had the corn crop out there that produced a stock for the beans to climb up. So now you had the, the structure for the beans to thrive. The beans were a legume, so they were adding nitrogen to feed the corn crop. The squash were a great ground cover to control the weeds. It was a really complementary system, and all three of them did very well for them. The other thing they did is they used to put fish down in, in the soil. Where have you seen this scenario before? You've got a cash crop in the middle, you've got your companion crops, and you've got a carbon-based fertilizer. I think it's really funny when people look at what we're doing on our farm now and they say, oh, that's really progressive of you guys. It's really nice that you're going this direction. We're not doing anything on our farm that hasn't been done before. We just got lost somewhere down the road. So once again, I think it's funny when we talk about, well, that's the way we've always done it. Do you know how long agriculture has been around? Somewhere between 9,000 and 7,000 BC was the beginning of agriculture. Were they using chemicals back then? Were they destroying their soils? They didn't have the, this stuff available to them. So then 1837, the introduction of the steel plow, the beginning of mass efficient destruction of soil particles. And that was 1837. You compare that to 9000 BC, but we, we want to say, well, why do you apply your soil? That's the way we've always done it. Come on, guys. This is, you know, 200 years out of versus 10,000. Um, 1842 is when chemical fertilizer started to come into the picture. That wasn't very long ago, guys. Chem chemical fertility hasn't been around very long. It's kind of a new deal. Then DDT, the pesticides, you know, those were, that was 1939 when we really started getting hooked on those. So I think what we need to do now is stop and look back and realize that, you know, it, what it kind of reminds me of is, is sometimes you have a product out there that's really good and somebody comes along and they want to improve on the system. They think they're going to change the world. You know what it reminds me of? Do you remember New Coke? One of the biggest marketing blenders. And we see that now. At the time, they thought they were geniuses. Turns out, classic Coke was pretty good stuff. I hope that someday we look back at conventional agriculture and realize that conventional agriculture was New Coke. I hope we look back at conventional agriculture and laugh at how foolish we were to try that. At least we'll realize it was only a couple hundred years that we tried it, realized that that wasn't working. It's time to get back to the classic, guys. So it's the way we've always done it, right? Look at this picture. Why do you guys think I like this picture? What stands out in this picture to you guys? Diversity. The Egyptians, they knew the trouble with growing monocultures, but monocultures is how we've always done it, right? It's time to get back. So when I, I have, it's funny, when I talk to a lot of people about conventional agriculture and where we are now, they wonder, well, why in the world are we doing what we're doing? And there's one word that keeps coming back to me. Addiction. We're addicted to conventional agriculture. And if you don't believe me, look at the definition of addiction. The state of being enslaved to a habit or practice. Does anybody in here feel like they are addicted to conventional agriculture? There's, there's one hand, we got one guy. I, I think the fact that you're here today is a good sign that you realize that maybe what you're doing isn't quite right. But that's the trouble is guys are having a hard time figuring out how to get out of this. And I think it's really interesting. I, I really did a lot of research on addiction. I, I was kind of curious. 
I wanted to see what the, how to figure out if somebody was addicted. Here's the diagnosis of an addiction. Tolerance. The substance has less effect on the patient because the body has developed tolerance. They need more and more of it to get the same pleasure. Now obviously they're talking about the human body and they're talking about substances. Let's change just a few words in this statement, keep the context the same, but let's apply it to conventional agriculture. Resistance. The substance has less effect on the crop because the pest or disease has developed resistance. They need more and more of it to get the same results. Does that kind of hit home for a few of you? Another diagnosis. The patient frequently takes higher than intended doses of the substance. The patient often tries to quit or cut down. Let's apply that to agriculture. The farmer increases the rates and frequency of chemical application. The farmer often tries to quit or cut down. One more for you. Even though patients know it causes physiological, physical problems, they continue taking it. Do you think we see that in conventional agriculture? Even though the farmer knows it causes ecological, environmental problems, they continue using it. Do you think we're stuck in that rut as a whole in, in conventional agriculture? But there's hope. And I, I want to let you guys know the reason I feel comfortable coming up here and standing here and kind of pointing the finger a little and let you guys know that there's an addiction here is because the reason I can tell you this is because Rocky Farms is a former addict. We were there. We, the, the thing that makes separates us from the rest of conventional agriculture is we found a way to break that addiction. So what's interesting is when you start looking at how to treat an addiction. Admitting that one cannot control that one cannot control one's addiction or compulsion. And like I said, the fact you guys are here, you're here for a reason. You're here to learn something new and find a different way to do things. Examining past errors with the help of a sponsor. That's where I feel like my role is. I'm, I'm the recovering addict. I'm here to help you guys. I'm your sponsor. But also, I had other sponsors. Jay's been huge for me. Um, Ray Archuleta, he's been a great sponsor for us. And these, everybody, all, all of us at one time were addicted to conventional agriculture. So we're no different than you. We don't feel like we're better than you. It's just we were able to find a way out. We see what it's like to get out of these addictions and we, want, we are here to help you guys. So now that we've admitted this and you have a sponsor, well, it's time to start making amends for these errors. And here's the really important one. Learning to live a new life with a new code of behavior. You look at that first slide I gave you versus how it ended up at the end. We have a totally different outlook on how we're farming now. We no longer want to remove life from the system. We want to add it back. You completely change the entire culture of your farm once you start heading down this, down this direction. And what's it really interesting about addiction is you can be addicted to good things as well. You start talking about diversity, you know, Jay introduced me to this great thing known as diversity. Now I'm addicted to bringing diversity onto our farm. I'm trying to find more and more ways to bring it on because I've seen the benefit of that. Then once you get through those addictions, this is the, the phase I'm in right now. Helping others who suffer from addictions or compulsions. There's, there's help out there, there's a network for you, but the first thing is admitting that we have some issues there in, in agriculture. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this, there's a really good book out there as far as like how habits are formed. And they always talk about these habit loops. You start off with a cue, you have your routine, and you have your reward. And as long as you keep getting that reward, it take, every time you get that cue again, you keep falling into that same loop. So now here you're talking about Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and when you have that cue instead of going and getting a drink, you're going and talking to somebody and you're, you're ending up at the, at the same reward there. Well, I think this, these habit loops apply very well to conventional agriculture as well. So now in conventional agriculture, our cue is in, we go out to the field and we see an aphid. Well, what's our response? That aphid's causing damage to my crop, so I must poison it and kill it. So the reward is we go out the next day and the aphid are gone. But we already talked about how removing that one system, it takes you back to now you have a higher aphid infestation. Well, I've got aphid out there again. Well, now I'm, I'm, I, I know that the insecticide worked the first time. Now I have no other choice. My brain tells me I need to go out there with another insecticide. So you get stuck in this rut. You get stuck in this loop, and it's hard finding a way out of there. So what we've done is, like I said, we're still, we are still control, concerned with controlling aphid in our field, but we just have a different approach to it. I'm addicted to controlling aphid as well, but it's how I get there. So now when I see aphid in my field in a population that's too many, I know I need more predators out there. 
And when you get the, you're able to bring predators in, you're able to actually uh, establish control. And you'll notice one thing that's really different here on the reward. We never try to eradicate a pest from our system. Our, our goal is always to control the pest. We want the pest in balance. The two belong there together. So here's kind of what I've been working on in my greenhouse. Um, I, sometimes in the summer I'll get an aphid infestation in my greenhouse. And I've tried bringing ladybugs in before and releasing them into the greenhouse and they would always leave and I never got any biocontrol established in there. The thing I was missing is I didn't have the proper environment for the ladybugs to thrive in between my infestations. So the thing I did different this year is I planted a multi-species flowering crop in there. Ladybugs can feed off of the nectar of these flowers in between infestations. So now I've got the flowering crop out there. I've got the home for these ladybugs to thrive. So now when the aphid come in and try establishing their populations, I've got my defense system set up. This is the first year that I ever felt like I won the war on aphids in that greenhouse. And that's the thing that was missing. So one, one more thing to keep in mind when you know, we're talking about addictions and just trying to figure out how we got stuck in this rut and where we are. I think it's really interesting when you look at just the advertising that is involved with some of these products too. We got the Marlboro Man up here. I, you know, like a lot of people have blamed him in the past for getting people hooked on cigarettes. You know, he's this big tough guy, really creates this image and even though the warning label is right there on, on, the, on the poster, don't, don't smoke this stuff, it's bad for you guys, but you still got people hooked. But I think it's really funny when you compare that to a fungicide ad for potatoes. There's your knight in his shining armor. This product is here to protect you. Don't dare try and grow in this crop without me. I'm here to save you. So, I mean, there's a lot of tricky little things going on out there that are kind of feed into the addiction and, and have gotten us stuck in this rut, guys. Here's an example of uh, a product made by Bayer. Look at the guy in his comical costume out there trying to sell a product that we all know is bad. And what does this remind you of? I think there's a huge correlation there. I think it's something to keep in mind as we move forward. But like I said, there is hope. We have a decision that can be made. We can decide to continue down this path with bad habits, or we can start forming good habits. Like I said, once you start heading down this path of bringing life back into your soil, it is very addictive too. Like I said, I've got 13 species growing out there. I'm not pleased yet. I've got to find a way to bring more, more, more in. But at least it's a healthy habit that I've developed. Here's another really good chart. It comes out of a paper that Ray Archuleta had sent me. But I think it's really good to keep in mind. Can you guys see that pretty good? It's kind of, it's similar to what I've already presented here, but it's just in more of a linear form. So right there in the middle, you have the agroecosystem agri management. And you have a decision to head one of two directions. And I think where a lot of people fail is when they, they want to get out of the rut they're in, and they want to start heading a different direction, but what they do is they head in a new direction with this one part of it, but they're still stuck in the old ruts with the other part. So the thing that's missing when the guys are trying to make this transition is commitment. You've got to head one direction or the other. It's really hard to head both directions at the same time. So if you're ready to head this direction and want to start making some changes, it can be done. You've got sponsors out there, you've got a lot of resources out there, but it takes a commitment from you. As far as developing resources, I'm trying to develop an, an online format for people to have discussions. I'm hoping it goes coast to coast. Uh, Chuck's been real active on this one, but it, it's on Google Plus. If any of you have a Gmail account, go on to Google Plus and join our soil health community. Really encourage it. We've got some good chatter going on on there. We don't have too many guys on there just yet, but we've had guys from coast to coast joining all the time. A lot of really good resources on here. If you ever have a question, pop a question on there and you'll get a lot of responses. And the more people we get added to this, the larger this network becomes. Like I said, I'm really trying to create this support network for guys that are trying to find a way out of these ruts. Um, if you go to Google+, Plus, there's a section for communities and the community is called Soil Health. Yeah. That's just, uh, it's kind of like Facebook. It's kind of that same format. You have to join a community, but then just becomes an interactive format for you. 
Then uh, Rocky Farms does have a Facebook page too. Um, I like to put a lot of pictures up on there. It's a good place to get some discussion going too. So if you guys ever want to join that, it, it's a good way to kind of keep up on what, what we're doing. So just a few points to, to take home with you today. You know, quit avoiding your problems and start solving problems. I think that's too much of the problem with conventional agriculture is when you go out there and try killing components, you're really, you're not accepting the big picture and what's truly going on there. Quit trying to hide from your problems and start solving these problems. Um, I don't, we don't have much choice on this. You know, a lot of people look at what we're doing with our soil health and they think it's neat. And they're all good for you guys. But we all need to get on board with this, guys. We're, we're in big trouble. There was a great article Gabe Brown had sent out not too long ago talking about the current rate of degradation of our soil in this country. They're estimating we've got somewhere between 40 and 50 years of topsoil left at the rate we're going. I probably won't be around to see it, but I've got a couple of girls at home. I want to make sure they can keep farming. Gail Fuller made a great comment. He said, at the rate we're going, our kids better learn how to farm rocks. We're already 20, 30 years behind. We need to start making significant changes right now. This isn't just a, a cool theory or something that's neat to try. This is serious. This is the existence of the human population on this earth. It, it's very serious. Um, it all starts by encouraging life in the soil. The complete system. It's a holistic approach. You know, every, every time you do something out there, it has a chain reaction on everything else out there. We need to start looking at the big picture and trying to figure out how to fit all these pieces back together. <laughs> Um, like I mentioned before, focus on quality and less on quantity. We've got some big issues there. Conventional agriculture has, has led us into this addiction with quantity. Yield, 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 yield. We want to go to the coffee shop and brag about yield. How can we never see anybody showing up bragging about quality of his crop, the nutrient content of his crop? That's what's really important. Um, eliminate expenses from your operation and start investing in your soil. That's one thing that's really nice for us is when you look at conventional agriculture, whenever you apply a pesticide or something like that, it's just purely an expense. It's trying to get you through that season, that crop. Everything we do now by adding life into the soil, if we add too much compost or too much fertility, some carbon base, we can never overdo it. it, can, it if we have it out there, it banks in the soil and it's actually helping us further down the road. We're still, every single year, we seem to cut our inputs down more and more every year. And, which is, and we're still growing the same crop. So, I mean, it becomes basic algebra at that point. If you're reducing your inputs, but your in income's still the same, you're increasing your profitability. So we need to start looking at that. And then just start breaking bad habits and start forming good habits. We need some leaders in this area to really step up and start heading, leading the charge and taking a new direction, getting your neighbors excited about it, getting some chatter going about what's going on out there. Start working together and, and start heading in the right direction. So that's basically about all I have for you for the presentation, but I wanted to kind of open it up for some questions if you wanted to have some conversation right now. Yeah, um, we, use, we don't use um, hydrogen peroxide on our place, but what we do use is ozone generators. And what it is, is it's, uh, I'll get a little technical on you, but you, you've got some glass tubes there with a 10,000 volt charge through it. It's taking O2 from the atmosphere, splitting them apart, and you have O1. So now you have a more reactive form of oxygen. That can bond to the water, forming H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. So it's the same concept. But what's really nice about that is, is once again, it's mimicking nature. The thing what we really feel like we're doing with those ozone generators is we're simulating rainwater as opposed to well water. Because when it rains, you know that nice smell you get? That's exactly what our irrigation water smells like now that it has that ozone in there. It's done great things for us as far as controlling foliar diseases. It's really helped open up our soil. Just like after you get a rain versus irrigating a crop, that soil opens up for you. We're doing that with every single irrigation. So that was actually the first thing we ever did to lead us down the path of soil health. We started using those ozone generators. We were adding oxygen into the soil, creating a better environment for the biology in the soil. That's what really started our thought process of maybe we're doing something wrong here. Maybe we need to head a different direction. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Thank you. Okay. Could you hold the mic here? We'll use this microphone. Can you relate? Uh, I know when I bought my cover crops, I don't think I paid more than a dollar a pound for mine. I don't know what you guys are paying. 
Um, I think the Tim Species mix, I was about 90 cents a pound. Yeah, so I mean, it's... it's yeah, and I was planting about 40 pounds per acre. So I mean, I, I know, was that come out like 37, 38 dollars per acre? Oh, it, it's, it's money easy spend, because that's what's funny, I don't know, two years ago I kind of included that in my presentation, you know, when we were doing the potato barley rotation versus the potato green manure rotation. That's what's funny is when we first went to the green manure, we thought, well, we're going to lose this other cash crop. It's going to hurt us financially, but we were willing to accept that. But we're so much better off financially now because we've reduced our inputs on the potato crop by more than what we were making off that other cash crop because the barley wasn't doing anything to promote the health of our soil. Once we started really focusing on that soil, it changed our economics. Now we've gotten to the point where we've improved our soil by enough that if we ever get some more water, you know, water is still a big issue there. If we get in excess of water, I would like to start bringing in some other crops into that rotation now that we have that soil health to support it. But at the time, we didn't have the soil health to support it, and it was catching up with us. I'm curious to know, you started 20 years ago. How long did it take before you could see, feel, and what was that first sign that there was a new change going on? Um, at the time, we didn't have the resources available that you guys have available now. It took us a lot longer because we were figuring it out as we went along. If, if we could go back now with the knowledge we have now, two or three years, I think you can make huge, huge strides. It takes a while to get everything in place, get everything working together. You're bringing life back. That does take some time. Um, Let's see, what was the other part? Oh, the first things we saw, the, the tilth of our soil was one of the first things we saw. It became much looser. We didn't have a crust on top of the soil. It started affecting our irrigations and the smell of the soil. It wasn't the stagnant dirt smell. It became alive. It had a nice soil smell to it. Um, then the earthworm populations. It was, there was one year where we just had a spike in earthworm populations. And that's a huge thing because you can't have the earthworm populations without having the other components there first. It, you know, it kind of comes further down the chain. But we had so many earthworms there that when we were out there digging potatoes, they were just hanging off the digger chains. They were just everywhere. It was like a horror movie. But eventually, you know, just like when you have natural populations coming back, you have that curve, you spike, and then you come back down, then it levels out. That was right at the top of that spike, and we don't have that issue anymore, but we've got a wonderful, healthy population of earthworms now. Any other questions? We will be taking a break after Brendan before the panel. So hold on, Steve. Steve. Two years ago, Brendan, you, you did your economic analysis and presented some economic data that you generated cost savings um, to your operation by, by virtue of your soil health practices. Do, do you, can you still comment on that? I mean, bottom line, financials. Bottom line, financials. Um, I, well, how specific do you want me to get? I do have that presentation still. If you want me to throw it up there, I can, I can go through that briefly for you. Might take just a minute to download. But I don't, know, I'll, I don't know how to answer that necessarily. Like I said, it really comes down to investing in our soil. I think a lot of times when guys make this transition, it, it can be a rough transition. Because when you make this shift, you have to have a little bit more input to begin with if you want to level out. You know, if you want to completely go cold turkey and get away conventional ag in one, one year, it's going to hurt you because it takes a while to bring that system back. So I, I've been working with some guys in the valley and trying to get them, you know, we're, they're AA with me, Agricultural Anonymous, and we're going through this process. And we've been able to make huge strides in, in a couple of years, but what I do is I don't have these guys go cold turkey like what we do. I like to have them kind of phase into it a little bit. So what they're doing is keeping their fertility program about where it was, but they're starting to feed the soil, bring in the carbon-based fertilizers, doing the multi-species. And then after they can go two, three years like that, then they can really cut back on their other inputs. And they're cutting back by enough that once we get to that point, that it's making up for the, those initial expenses at first. So that, that's another problem with conventional ag is just, it, it's very short-sighted. Everybody always is worried about how much money am I making this year? What's my income? Everybody's worried about income. We need to start focusing more on profitability and looking at it from a larger scale. 
I think it's really funny when you talk to a lot of guys back in the valley about green manure crops. You just start telling them the benefits, the water savings, all these other things. Like, oh, that's great, but my banker won't let me do it. When we went to our banker and told him that first year, we're not growing barley this year. We're doing a green manure and explain to him why. Is it good for you guys? You know, it's, just, it's a lot of misconceptions out there economically. I guarantee we're, we're one of the more, you know, we're doing the specialties too, so we're a little bit different there, but just when you look at our inputs versus our production, we're one of the more profitable farms in the valley on a per acre basis. But that's what's really funny. Everybody thinks, oh, conventional agriculture is all about the bottom line and improving production and all that, but it, 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 we're, we're wrong on that. Oh, I'll be right there. Yeah, that's going to take too long. Um, yeah, my question to you, um, Brandon, is that I think this data that you're talking about is really important. I'm wondering, though, are you, do you have to keep all this yourself and this network of folks who are working with you, or are you getting some support to um, uh, look at scientific data, have things um, um, researched, with some kind of a partnership so you guys don't have to handle all that yourself? And is there a way to get that data out to more people? Because that communication seems to me really important. It's a complete difference from the traditional conventional data. I'm not sure we have time to wait for data. <laughs> uh, three, I want to, it was two or three years ago, we had a gal from CSU come out to our place and she wanted to pull some soil samples. She knew what we were doing. She wanted to compare the rhizobacter on the root system of our plants versus a conventional system and versus an organic system. I still don't have any data back from that. And once we get the data back, I think it's just going to support what we already know. Yes, it's better. So what good did that data do? So we, I, I don't get, I was trying to check a little bit out this earlier, just, I don't get too hung up on data because we've got other things going on out there that are key, the clues that we're doing the right thing. When you look, uh, the quality of our crop is greatly improved. We throw less away. Um, we grow a purple potato that used to have rustening on it. it, it they're so clean and bright and purple now. And I think what that is, is, you know, at CCU they say you need a higher calcium in those plants to get rid of that rustening. We didn't add more calcium to the soil, but what we were doing is growing this buckwheat that's freeing up the phosphorus and the calcium, and now the calcium is more available to the plant. So, I mean, there's a lot of indicators all along the way that show you that you're doing the right thing. I said, when you walk in our, our, with, with certified seeds, another great example. They warned us when we stopped using insecticides. They said this would break our farm, and we not, would not be able to continue as certified seed growers if we were not going to go out there and control those aphid. Those aphid were going to destroy our certified seed program. Yeah, here we are, we got to the point where we were decreasing our readings every single year. We were decreasing the infestations that were happening in our soil without using insecticide. I mean, there's a lot of keys everywhere out there that, you know, I, I don't feel it's necessary, I, I don't really care what the name is of all the different bacteria in the soil. All I know, all I care about is we have a bunch of them out there. You want diversity out there, you want populations out there. Most of the stuff that we're inoculating our soils with are already exist out there. But the thing that's missing is the environment for those populations to thrive. So that's what we really focus on, is creating the proper environment for what's already there to function properly. But I'm not opposed to research and data, and anytime I can get somebody to come and put something on paper and a chart or graph that supports what I'm doing, yeah, that's great. I'm fine with that. But I don't necessarily go out and seek it. Usually about the second week of June, um, I've got a lot of warm season crops in there, and for us, we usually figure about the 10th of June is when we're done with frost. We've got a really short season, so I really have to wait until we're done with the frost period. Then I'll go out and plant the green manure crop. We grow it for about six weeks. That's where the water savings really comes in because we're growing a crop. We're not, when we grow, plant a green manure crop, we don't have to raise it to maturities. We're not trying to develop seed. We're just trying to get biomass out there, so we're growing at six weeks versus three months like you would with a barley crop. So it's a shorter season, so that's where the water savings really come in. And that's actually how we determine when to terminate the crop, is we really look at the buckwheat. They start forming some seed on there, that's when we cut it off and terminate. So we don't want to create a huge seed issue out there with something the next year or two. Any other questions? Yeah, here behind you.
Yeah, we do. We, we go through with a flail chopper to help chop up the residue. Then we go through with a sunflower mulcher, which is probably only going about 12 inches deep, but it, what it does is it helps cover up the residue a little bit, gets us good residue soil contact, because like I said, we, we need to break our residue down pretty rapidly because we don't want much residue left. Um, so what we did actually this year is we changed it up a little bit. What we used to do is we'd go through and chop it with the sun, then go through with the sunflower, incorporate it, then that's when we apply our compost. I think there's a lot of value to adding compost on top of that freshly incorporated green manure because there's so much biological activity going on there. I think there's a synergistic effect by having those applied at the same time. So then we would apply that compost. We don't want it on top, so we'd go back with the disc just to help incorporate the compost. So this year we did it a little bit different. We actually spread the compost on the green manure crop while it was still standing, chopped it and incorporated it, and we left it alone until after potato harvest time. What was really nice about that is before when we incorporated a dish right away to work in that residue, the residue passed. Then we had bare soil out there. So that by incorporating it at the one time, what happened is you had these deep radishes in there and turnips. They were popped up and put back down and they continued to grow. So the sunflower was able to terminate the buckwheat, the Sudan, a lot of those crops, but the radishes actually continued to grow. They didn't have the other plants out there. They actually increased the girth and the depth of the, the radishes and did us a lot more benefit there. So then after potato harvest, we came in with the disc to terminate that crop to get it worked in. And I went ahead and rowed out right away. So my potato rows for next year are, are already done. And I like that because now I, I made my rows in the fall. That soil's sitting there. It's given the chance for the biology to regather itself, get, get in the populations it needs. Work. So now when we plant potatoes in the spring, we're ready to go. Um, the other thing too, the reason I did that is before I would row out in the spring, but the trouble is you have all the snow out there, it melts, you go through and row out and you lose so much moisture. Now whatever moisture I'm getting through snow is going to be trapped out there and I won't lose it by that extra tillage practice. And it'll be out of that much more uh, moisture in the reservoir for, for uh, moving forward with the potato crop. Any other questions? Well, we've, we've got such a short growing season and we get a lot colder. I mean, in certain areas you can get away with that, but I mean, it's just not an option where we are. And like I said, the residue, it's a matter of finding that balance. Like I said, in some years we worked it in too fast, it broke down too fast and we didn't have that cover. But now we're trying to find that balance where we want a little residue out there, because I agree, you get a lot of protection from that. There's a lot of value in that. But like I said, if we have too much residue out there in our potato rows when we're trying to plant potatoes, you get the residue balling up on you and you just get a, a, a train wreck out there and it just doesn't work for us. So within the potato world, it's a lot different deal. Now when Jay talks er, later, he's gonna be talking about some di totally different scenarios where they're trying to leave as much residue on top as possible. And there's benefits to that in, in crops that aren't like potatoes. The potatoes just, it's a different beast because we've got to go in and disturb that soil when we're harvesting the crop and it just, his systems don't completely translate to what we're doing. So I realize there's some confusion there. So we're, we're trying to get as much plant growth out there as possible, getting some, leaving some residue on top because I mean I agree with what he's talking about as far as the benefit we're getting from that. Depends on the year. Uh, we usually figure typical is maybe 100 frost free growing days. That's if we're lucky. It's short. Like I said, we're, we usually figure, it, we try to plant about a month before our last frost free date. And we usually figure 10th of June is kind of the rule of thumb around there. You really don't want potatoes popping up before the 10th of June. So it, it, it's a short window. So that's where we have a lot of limitations. You go up to North Dakota, I mean, they've got two more months to play with. If I was growing potatoes in North Dakota, I would probably be harvesting the crop and planting, making sure I've got another crop out there following the potato crop. It opens up so many more doors for you. It's such a different environment out there. But where we are, we've really got a lot of limitations. And then the other problem with us, too, is our, our water situation. We live in a desert. We don't get enough rainfall to grow a crop. So we're not in these dry land situations. That's why I was so jealous when I went out to Keith Burns. They wanted some seed plots. They just went out and planted them wherever. We've got to make sure ours are under the pivot. 
Otherwise, they, you know, we don't grow anything in the corners. So whenever we have to be careful too, is we want as much life out there in the soil, we want growing plants out there, but at the same time, we're in a world of hurt in our water situation too. So we've got to find that balance there. We want to have as much growing out there as possible, but we're still trying to conserve as much water as possible too. So we've got to really keep both of those in mind when we're moving forward with that.